<clears throat> thank you sajee for this opportunity it's a, a privilege to be speaking on uh, telangana vidyavantula vedika forum uh, so well okay today i'll speak on uh, i've written on this i think that paper has been circulated is broadly looking at how should one understand and approach uh, the spread of right wing populism uh, in india why mm -hmm. try to increase the volume yeah huh? is yes. it not so yeah please huh? yeah is it better now yes huh? okay so uh, uh, trying to understand that why there is a certain kind of a ground swell and a certain kind of a growing consent for uh, is it better saji yeah yes yeah uh, -huh. okay. uh for for right wing politics in india today broadly we are in popular parlance referring to it as uh, hindutva politics so the first point is that mere moral negation or moral condemnation of uh, uh, right wing politics is perhaps not sufficient you know that they are evil or they have uh, politics which are authoritarian no doubt there is authoritarianism they they have a coercive and hierarchical world view so on and so forth but there is also a consent that is developing uh, across caste across regions across classes across social groups and that consent uh, should actually worry us and to and to sort of uh, attempt uh, make a political analysis of why is right growing why is the social narrative of right wing politics uh, becoming attractive for various social groups and that's where i'm trying to analyze uh, perhaps the limitations of secular progressive politics uh, perhaps the need to rethink certain social categories uh, essentially by the left in india left of uh, various currents and uh, try and see whether we can make so i'll make certain few propositions uh, these are working uh, propositions we can i'm open for debate and we can sort of revisit those issues uh, that i have in mind uh, and and then maybe debate so the first point is that what do we do in a society like india uh, which has a hindu majority that this whole question of hindu identity that has become increasingly attractive and that is sort of uh, serving multiple purposes that should we now uh, revisit the question of hinduism uh, hindu identity and should progressive politics rearticulate what a hindu identity constitutes in the current context that have we sort of uh, reduced hinduism and hindu identity only to the uh, brahmanic hindu tradition while hinduism is you know heterogeneous it has multiple other reform movements uh, and uh, by by not articulating anything effectively on hindu identity have we not left a whole range whole field open to uh, right wing uh, uh, or cultural organizations like the rss to continuously inform us what hinduism means and one immediate obviously objection we always raise is that obviously hinduism has been hierarchical it has followed caste system it has justified varna is that all to hinduism or is it one of traditions just one of the traditions uh, within hinduism for instance even greek philosophers like aristotle whom we teach in political philosophy have supported slavery in the past yet we we teach aristotle J S Mill supported colonialism, yet we teach uh, uh, J S Mill as the father of liberalism. Therefore, there is uh, what I call this a problem of retrieval. That is, there are are there ways of retrieving our past uh, social, cultural, and religious uh, traditions uh, within India, and should right, uh, should left wing, secular, progressive, democratic forces. revisit this question if it is so in what way this is my first uh, question that we can uh, possibly come back to the second uh, important point uh, is in terms of how the right wing political mobilization today in india is turning progressive political discourses progressive political practices on their head for instance the whole debate on triple talaq this whole gender question within the minorities 
or the question of minorities within minorities. For instance, now BJP is raising the question of uh, Pasmanda Muslims, reservation for Pasmanda Muslims. Uh, therefore, what they are doing is to divide Muslims internally across various frictions, like Shia Sunni conflict that exists. But they are dividing through what one would ideally identify them as progressive interventions, that Pasmandas are left out within Muslims. They are not part of Muslim social elite, so they are talking about now reservations for Pasmanda Muslims. And, uh, and therefore, internally, they are dividing the Muslim community. So that's one end of the problem. The second interesting thing that they are doing is that UP election has been you know, a, a signatory to this, uh, has been a signpost to this, is that uh, also looking at the divisions within Hinduism, Hindu religion. Therefore, they are dividing OBC into smaller OBC subcasts. They are uh, actively supporting and encouraging subdivision within Dalits. BJP is today one of the parties which is vigorously uh, propagating subdivision within Dalits. Therefore, a section of Dalits who were, who were left unrepresented through policies of reservation, through the mainstream Dalit politics, is now gradually moving towards uh, BJP and RSS. Therefore, this whole patron-client relation that existed within the OBCs, within the Dalits, an issue that was not progressively touched upon by the left progressive forces. Today, BJP is making headway into those. One, they're dividing Dalits into smaller subcasts, and at the other hand, conjoining them back to a larger Hindu identity. So these two processes are happening simultaneously. And we need to take what is this process that the BJP has initiated, that is giving them political representation on one hand and joining them to a, a, an old kind of a cultural uh, association, cultural imagination of the RSS kind. So both seem to be working, that is representation on one end and uh, can we refer to this as uh, it's not the old kind of the RSS that we always knew, that generally we tend to analyze among left circles, but what I called in some of my articles as de-Brahmanized Hinduization, that can we really equate Brahmanism and Hinduism? Or is there a possibility that RSS through its right-wing politics can accommodate Dalits, backward caste, Sudras through different political and cultural practices? And therefore, we need to take this question instead of assuming that Dalits and the OBCs have a natural conflict with right-wing politics. There's a larger, more complex theory on questions of masculinity and all. I don't have the time to get into all of that. So this is a second question that I'm posing. It's a, like a poser that, uh, that uh, subaltern castes today in India are not in any kind of a natural given conflict with right-wing political mobilization. That it is possible that some of their social anxieties, like social stigma, uh, can be addressed uh, through right-wing political mobilization. Now, how does that happen? As I said, it's a longish theory, and we should all collectively now think of this question as to why this is becoming more attractive for uh, subaltern caste. Why would certain sections of the list want to, if you go by electoral statistics, if you go by all recent trends in Indian politics, there is a groundswell. Uh, today, OBCs play a massive role. Uh, OBC support for BJP across states in India. It, it, there's a, there's a, a substantive support. Now, why is that happening? in spite of on the Varna system, they being uh, referred to as the Shudras, is a question that we should uh, uh, pause and ponder over. Third uh, question is in terms of uh, what I would refer to as the mobilization of emotions and passions. You know, Gramsci talks about this uh, in his cultural writings that uh, passions are always core of politics. And Gramsci had uh, sort of uh, warned us long back Today, we are uh, seeing some of that in a more robust form in the right-wing political mobilization. When we talk of emotions and passions, what matters, therefore, in this political mobilization or in your political perception is not merely evidence, is not merely your material social location, but what you tend to imagine in politics. So there is, there is a certain gap between 
a certain imagination, a certain gut feelings, a certain instinct reaction, and your material social rea uh, reality. There is no easy match between these two. Often left analysis uh, is, uh, uh, is based on structures, structural location, which broadly we talk in terms of class location, uh, your material condition. But that materiality, that class location is mediated. It is not a, again, not a natural readily available it is mediated through various other variables and emotions and passions is one such variable where people can imagine certain things. Uh, Marxism, I do not want to get into theory of that, try to deal this through ideas of false consciousness and so on and so forth. But what we are witnessing today is that these passions and emotions some of the uh, social theorists have referred to it as part of emotional intelligence. That is, you, re you relate to the reality through certain perceptions, through certain, certain valorization. And this is happening all the time. And we do that in our everyday life. We do that in, as part of political mobilization, so on and so forth. Therefore, history, this question of history that has been on for so long, uh, cannot be merely in terms of past series of events, but how we would want to imagine a certain history. So this idea of a certain imagination that people have, what do we do with it? How does, how do left progressive politics play around? Because often if we think that this is not evidence, this is not objective, this is not structural, uh, we often think that most of this is obscurantism and this lies outside. But politics is not merely about hard evidence. Politics is not merely about hard facts. Politics is also about people's perception. So here, for instance, if you look at recent set of mobilization that the right wing has indulged in, look at the range of uh, protest politics by dominant castes, like the Marathas, Patidars, Jats, Kapus in Andhra Pradesh, so on and so forth. Well, factually, we would want to, we would see that all evidence suggests that these are relatively dominant castes. These are much better off than Dalits and Muslims. But in self-perception of these own castes, uh, there is a certain threat perception they are suffering from. There's a sense of an anxiety. There's a sense of a decline. There's a sense of other castes overtaking them. Uh, through reservations. Therefore, they also want, and there's, of course, there's a sustained agrarian crisis. These are all agrarian caste. And therefore, in this catch-up game, uh, we have witnessed a range of uh, protest movements. Now, this again leads to a question for all of us that what is the agenda of progressive left politics for dominant caste? For poor among the dominant caste? For those castes which are suffering, obviously social transformation bring, brings in a certain kind of a social stress. These castes have, are, are feeling the heat of the, the mobility that Dalits have had in the last two, three decades because of thanks to constitutional reservation policy. That's one end of the story. But the other end of the story is that these castes finally have to be incorporated into more secular, progressive, democratic politics. Now, how do we intervene? What kind of an agenda can we set for dominant caste in India? I don't think left has seriously reflected on, on, this, on this question of how to make an appeal. On the, on the other hand, right is able to forge a strange kind of a cross-class alliance that they are able to uh, mobilize the dominant caste like the Jats and Patidars through the hurt pride that they suffer based on their declining status. On the other hand, they are also able to appeal to subaltern caste like Dalits and OBCs uh, based on the social stigma they are suffering. So, right is able to somehow succeed, at least for the time being, uh, to provide a certain kind of a social narrative whereby both the castes Cast at both ends of the spectrum seem to step, see themselves in the kind of social narrative that right is producing. Therefore, it's another challenge for left and progressive politics to really think that we'll have to produce a social narrative that is as large 
Now, and it's a difficult business because we are talking of class politics, we are talking of structural change, we are talking about a social you know, transformation of these castes. But then the question remains that these castes are here. How do we, what kind of an agenda will we have for uh, dominant caste groups in India, I think, uh, will be a significant question to, uh, to, in times to come. Third, uh, my fourth point would be that uh, another thing that right successfully does is that it has started this what uh, Saji, I think you have referred to in your introduction also and I think in our earlier talk in terms of this whole development business that uh, right wing has started. You know, development and nationalism uh, have multiple uh, significations. This is not a simple idea. On one end, they signify higher end capitalism. Therefore, they're talking about bullet trains, they're talking about fast and uh, smart cities, urbanization, so on and so forth. But development and nationalism is also about a certain kind of a commonality. They're also able to offer a certain discourse of uh, integration, of a certain discourse of fraternity, a certain discourse of uh, community. Can left appropriate the discourse of nationalism? Can left have only a secluded discourse or can we revisit this question? Can there be something called progressive nationalism? There have, there have been Marxist discourses on this in terms of questions of nationality and nationalism. Of course, we also talk about internationalism. Therefore, we'll have to, uh, the, the issue is this, that along with the question of differences in terms of class and caste, can left also talk about the question of fraternity? Ambedkar does it in his writings. While he talks about liberty and equality, he also lays emphasis on fraternity. Idea of civic associationism, idea of uh, a common brotherhood, idea of fraternal feeling, you know, something even Gandhi did in terms of his uh, political mobilization. In the Indian context, again, because of the porous nature of Hinduism, there are a lot of historical reasons, nature of anti-colonial movement, uh, divide between the social and the political. I'm not going to the details of all of that. There has been a sustained discourse of uh, com common community in, uh, in, in the Indian context. So therefore, can left intervene and appropriate the discourse of community and fraternity? Does it make sense for progressive politics to re-signify the meaning of community and fraternity uh, in the Indian context? If you see very interestingly, this is what BJP and RSS do in their discourse that they are for high-end corporate capitalism, but they seem to also understand that corporate capitalism displaces community with, with urbanization, migration, so on and so forth, and it raises community anxiety. If you see one of the glaring examples in the Indian context was this whole Rajput uh, protest on Padmavat movie, that you know that, that their whole community is under decline, their whole community has been humiliated, so on and so forth. This is partly a displaced problem, but what it signifies is that increasing corporate globalization, increasing marketization is also leading to various kinds of community anxieties. This whole business of their own traditional practices, so on and so forth. So what BJP does is that on one hand, it pursues high-end corporate capitalism. On the other hand, it also addresses the community anxieties that come about because of corporate capitalism. Therefore, they are pro-corporate, but anti-modern. This is a very interesting combination that they have offered us. <laughs> they support corporate globalization, but also pursue an anti-modern discourse in terms of love jihad, in terms of, against cosmopolitanism, against inter-religious marriages, uh, against free gender mixing, against a progressive uh, space for women, any number of examples one can take. So one of the formulations I make is that right is pro-corporate but anti-modern. This is a, there is an inner intention in that, but as 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 things stand today, uh, it seems to be working for them. Similarly, they seem to be combining uh, a talk of pure Hindu Vedic past and an aspirational future. 
So they're talking about new India, which is digital India. They're also talking about Vedic past, pure Hindu past, and a pure nation that existed, which was glorious history, so on and so forth. These two are again connected. Uh, again, I don't have time to get into those complex linkages. But what is interesting is this, that what in progressive secular politics, we think these are binaries. These are discontinuities. Right is able to draw continuity. So they're able to claim both a Vedic past. They're also talking about digital India. This is not a contradiction for them. They see a continuity. Therefore, you have these all bizarre statements by Congress CM saying that you have internet in Mahabharata time, you have a plastic surgery and whatnot. But apart from that bizarreness of that uh, RSS, for instance, one of the RSS Pracharaks recently uh, said that uh, the word industry came from Indus Valley civilization. And therefore, Indus was the first industrialized society in history. Well, whatever uh, the validity of those bizarre claims, the point is what should interest us is that they're able to draw a certain kind of a very strange continuity between claims of past glory, of Vedic pure Hindu past, and a technological a new India that is digital. So these are not divided for them, but they see a, a seamless uh, continuity. You see, one of the jokes that I always tell my students that how an average Indian responds when he falls sick, that he begins with allopathy. And if he does not, if allopathy does not cure him, he goes to homeopathy. If homeopathy does not cure him, he goes to naturopathy. And if naturopathy doesn't cure him, he goes to Tirupati. So you know that an average Indian can travel the time distance between allopathy and Tirupati uh, very fast. So between Vedic past and a digital India, uh, these are not dichotomous as a secular progressive politics sees them, but there can be some kind of a, uh, a seamless continuity that right is able to draw. So this social narrative, whatever its validity, is able to provide a certain kind of a social narrative that where different social groups that have materially conflicting interests are able to see their place in this kind of a right-wing social narrative, which is at the end hierarchized, authoritarian, all of that. But I think it is, it is uh, the uh, right is able to fuse a diversified strategy for a unified ideology. At the end of it, they do have a very unified ideology of creating a Hindu Rashtra or that is hierarchical, that is essentially authoritarian, that would be anti-liberal. But the strategy of doing that, it is, I think, not merely sufficient for us to criticize uh, uh, this kind of, that it is merely about violence and about hierarchy. But we, one has to understand this diversity of the strategies that the right is employing, which is making for an average Hindu in India a certain kind of an appeal, a certain kind of it is reflecting their social position today uh, in, the, uh, in, in their everyday reality. Therefore, my, I would conclude by arguing that uh, left has to rethink its strategy and what populism has brought is this new variables of emotions and passions, this new variable about dominant caste and hurt pride, the idea of social stigma, uh, the way of fusing past and future, uh, uh, as I said, pro-corporate, anti-modern. These, these strategies which are diversified are not merely opportunism of the right. This is not merely uh, you know, uh, immoral uh, practices of the right, but it, it, I think, signifies a certain kind of a contradictory social reality in India. And right without addressing those tensions uh, is able to provide a social narrative. And the left, what it can do is that it has to pick up these categories. While offering a critique of the right, it has to pick up, look at the role of emotions and passions. What role do they have in progressive transformative politics? Similarly, the role of, uh, as I said, questions of dominant caste, what kind of, uh, 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 what kind of uh, uh, role do, can we offer? What kind of a space can we offer in a progressive politics? Similarly, questions of community and fraternity, that it's not merely about contradictions and class conflict, but left has to also offer certain notions of fraternity, uh, certain notions of commonality, uh, perhaps even reappropriate certain ideas of nationalism, if possible. 
uh, with, in a more progressive notions of nationalism. So we'll have to regenerate. I think what populism has brought to court is that there's a new common sense that is being built in India today, where everyone can easily understand what right is doing. Left has to generate uh, that kind of a progressive populism, uh, a kind of progressive populism that has a much larger purchase to heterogeneous groups without undermining uh, the process of social and structural transformation. It's not an easy task, but it's something that we should all, it's time we all begin to think on that. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Saji, for the opportunity. Yeah, now I think uh, we'll start with a, uh, a, a few questions, right? Uh, maybe I will start like one or two questions and, you know, if you, anybody wants, you know, we have an option of, you know, raising a hand and we'll open this room for open conversation. <clears throat> the first question is, like, can you please explain the role of symbols, symbols of temple, cow, jihad, or Pakistan in, in the political, in the, in the project of, you know, right wing, you know, politics? Or did they learn a lesson from, you know, as Gramsci articulated, right, from the, uh, the European fascism, right? How do you draw the comparative parallel significance yeah, of symbols? It's a very good question. You know, that right is creating certain symbols, and these symbols have multiple meanings. Mm -hmm. but they do not have a single meaning. For instance, the notion of cow, I think, has multiple meanings to multiple social groups. It's not merely about a certain purity. Some, for some, it's about purity. For some, it is about peace. For some, it symbolizes peaceful Hindu Hindus. But if for some, it also symbolizes the reason why Hindus are vulnerable. This whole business of victimhood psyche that has been driven among Hindus, that since we are peace-loving, since we are non-violent, we have been taken for granted. You know, this, this narrative of victimhood, so cow also symbolizes a certain notion of vulnerability among Hindus. So each of these symbols as you take, it's very interesting. For Pakistan, for instance, you take, the right offers a critique of Pakistan for hunting down its minorities, which is partly true. Uh, Pakistan, it did happen that they drew out Christians, they drew out Ahmadiyas, now they are after Shias. So, uh, and left, we did not articulate these questions very strongly. It's time we speak up on these questions uh, very strongly. What right does is that it also criticizes army rule in Pakistan for being undemocratic. Even though, even as it criticizes Pakistan for that, it wants similar kind of practices in India. This is a very strange thing, you know, but a moral criticism leads to a moral justification of pursuing same things. And we don't seem to see a contradiction in this. You know, for average uh, Hindu I talk to, you know, among my relations, among friends, uh, that, you know, you are criticizing Pakistan for having army rule, but you want to eulogize your army. They don't see a contradiction. You are critical of Pakistan for hunting down its uh, minorities. You are doing similar thing through public lynching, but they don't see a contradiction. Similar about institutions, you know, the way right is offering a critique of institutions like judiciary. Left offered earlier critique of judicial institution because it's dysfunctional, it is not inclusive, so on and so forth. Right does it offer criticism of the institutions to further undermine institutions. So it's a very strange thing. So the, their, their critique of institutions is not to further strengthen them. So they use critique of institutions because they're dysfunctional. You have you need a demagogue. You need a strong decisive leader. So they're able to signify our old kind of critiques, therefore, in one sense, they're actually appropriating left progressive discourse. And, I, 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 and the sense that I get is that right has observed and learned from left. But on left, I think we have never seriously studied the right. We have only offered a very strong moral critique of what right does. But we never thought there is something in the discourse of the right that we need to reappropriate and give a pro progressive spin. We have summarily rejected all the right-wing strategies, whether it is about idea of fraternity, whether it's about community, whether it's about Hindu identity, whether it's about nation. Today, I think we need to, left has to also pick up that what is attractive? Why is right becoming social narrative attractive? 
and i think we need to politically understand that and as you said symbols is is a right place to begin with okay so <clears throat> swami uh, okay uh, swami do you want to ask a question uh, swami kiran yeah sure uh, yeah, uh, gopal uh-huh. uh, ajay uh, I mean, thank you so much it was such a enlightening and a wonderful uh, uh, disco i mean uh, i i would i would definitely call it discourse but it was a great uh, a uh, speech uh, and and very informative i do agree with um, uh, almost all the questions that you have raised uh, but i just want to add a couple of things to what you have said uh, and, and and yes uh, uh, i mean we are we are just considering left uh, which probably from a marxist perspective uh, but uh, but i think in general right uh, the right wing populism that is growing today is a, is a, is a result or is a consequence of uh, the failed policies of nehruvian uh, socialist uh, model quote unquote socialist model the mixed economy model that that created a lot of failure and uh, unfortunately our uh, old uh, communist uh, or marxist uh, uh, forefathers they not only uh, misunderstood uh, marxism they not only misinterpreted marxism they not only uh, uh, incorrectly applied marxism to indian society they were so fascinated by nehruvian mixed economy and socialist model that they just felt trapped to him and uh, they became part of the parliamentary economy right <clears throat> um, so from then onwards they got isolated you can clearly see uh, they got isolated i mean except for dd kosambi uh you know one of the one of the marxist historians who else talks about this the subaltern uh, uh, theories within indian uh, indian mythology or indian philosophy whoever who else talks about uh, lokayata or charvaka or uh, uh, or buddha or satyakama jabali and who else try, tries to represent the symbols of mahabharata in a way that they can be used for uh, for people you know uh, mahabharata can be interpreted in different ways i mean whether you believe it it's, it's happened or not happened but it does have a lot of uh, a lot of narratives in it and those narratives they can still be used i mean there are people who are who are worshiping draupadi as a, as a goddess in northern india in rajasthan they treat her as a goddess they treat her as a her symbol as their symbol and there are people who who are uh, who are worshiping barbarika the son of ghatotkacha who was a rebel and whose head was beheaded uh, by krishna uh, to uh, to see the mahabharata war because krishna realized that barbarika is more powerful than anyone in the, in the pandavas right so there are there are so many subaltern theories and there are so many uh, subaltern things that that the, the 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 communist or the marxist gurus uh, the forefathers have completely failed to understand they didn't apply uh, they they Uh, they didn't even bother about uh, rereading uh, dd kosambi or applying his theories things like that and and when maxarbari came uh, as a ray of hope from that uh, from that stagnant uh, marxist uh, uh, situation maxarbari also focused mostly on adivasis if you see from the beginning uh, they started focusing on adivasis from uh, maxarbari to shrikakulam and then when they came to uh, you know andhra pradesh uh, erstwal and the pradesh right now telangana karimnagar jagatyal sirsilla vemlawada etc they focused on the uh, rice coolies but they focused it only from the perspective of economic exploitation the social exploitation angle uh, the, the points you raised very nicely about caste a dominant castes and uh, the the marginalized caste the dalits the different subcastes and the dalits and the, and the ladder uh, ladder like caste system those were not really considered until 1990s when the caste question became really popular or uh, not popular but pressing and and demanding and for justice right so you are very right in saying that right has clearly appropriated where the left have failed and the left have failed because of several reasons uh, you can call it as their brahmanical roots or the way they have interpreted marxism or they the way they have ignored phule and ambedkar or there are several reasons you know 
కర్నూలి చావుకి వెయ్యి కారణాలు ఉన్నట్టు భారతదేశంలో కూడా మా లెఫ్ట్ చావుకి చాలా కారణాలు ఉన్నాయి సో అది మనం చెప్పుకోవడానికి మనకు కొంచెం ఇబ్బందిగా ఉంటది కానీ బట్ దట్ ఇస్ అ రియాలిటీ వీ హ్ టు యాక్సెప్ట్ ఇట్ అండ్ టు ఫైండ్ అ బెటర్ వే అంటే the the rise of right wing populism is not only what i'm trying to say is not only accountable the left is not only accountable but for it but all those people who rallied behind the uh, nehruvian model right uh, so the, that that model created a gap and uh, into that gap came rajiv gandhi who said uh, globalization and then came pv narasimha rao who basically enlarged that scope of globalization and and then came um, sonia gandhi who basically filled it up with corrupt scams and uh, and javgar rozgar yojanas which were giving free money to people uh, for no reason uh, you know free uh, i mean maybe it's helping some people but on the whole it seems to be a policy which is making people lazy or not not working etc right that's the kind of blame that uh, uh, the right wing populism is putting now mm-hmm. and then again with respect to marginalized communities or muslims or dalits or subcaste and the whole gambit of uh, you know failures that you see i think now you have you have rightly said uh, that we have to readdress the way we need to look at things that we have to re look at them you have to learn from people like phule ambedkar here in in india to its native roots and also from uh, from all the developments that have taken part uh, that that have taken uh, in the west after marxist uh, thought i mean i know you have quoted chantal mofe in your article in epw Uh, and then you know, as you quoted just now gramshi and other people uh, so those are all definitely useful but one question i have for you is uh, at this juncture right with so much of disunity among these people uh, I, you raise an interesting point about involving the dominant uh, castes right do you think ever uh, these dominant castes i mean what, what, where, where is the importance lying now is it in the in the rallying of uh, the marginalized uh, the subaltern the dalits uh, or the uh, obcs against right wing populism or is it is it in the rallying the dominant caste uh, the, uh, a section of the dominant caste uh, do you think they will sincerely come with uh, uh, with opposing right wing populism when compared to the obcs and other people so that's one question i had and second question is uh, uh, now the left has solely concentrated its agenda uh, at least the sincere left the honest left that i'm considering the sincerely uh, focusing its agenda on adivasis right if you look at all the dandakaranya and janatan sarkar and all that but the, the it has not built a democratic movement out the outside that space and tomorrow if this movement gets cornered there's nobody to speak from outside right so that kind of gap is still existing so what do you think uh, can be done better from that perspective well thanks for me this was a really good uh, intervention wonderful intervention and i'm glad that we are on the same page in terms of realizing both as you said in the first half of your uh, intervention that uh, you know we really like like if i if you take my personal case that we hardly have tools of intervening into indian history you know we hardly have taken our epics uh, seriously we have hardly taken popular symbols that people use popular everyday usages that when i talk to people who are outside our political circles uh, they have a cert- certain kind of a robust common sense from which they understand so we'll have to dig into those that kind of symbolism for instance mahabharata and all these texts you know whether it is ramayana mahabharata these are finally at the end of the hermeneutic text you know they're always open to multiple reinterpretations there are sections where they would support caste system you have examples of ekalavya you will have on the other hand examples of karna so you will have multiple narratives within the same text and therefore we'll have to dig into that symbolism and uh, rebuild a certain kind of a past which essentially means it's progressive right. and right. and the question that you raise in terms of dominant caste i think politics is all about building a certain social imaginary you know and that and there's always a certain kind of an open endedness that is possible and that's the beauty of politics politics as gramsci says is an art of possibility we we'll have to create those possibilities you know i think for instance uh, one is how to bring in dominant caste into social transformative process you know you have had in uh, andhra we have had experience of kammas uh, leading the communist movement how did they join these were dominant caste at one point in time similarly if you take subaltern groups like dalits there's nothing sacrosanct about dalits or even adivasis you know there have been examples in uh, uh, odisha my next book which i am editing is i am looking at the intra subaltern conflict where 
tribals have practiced untouchability against dalits tribals have been oppressors against dalits so there's nothing natural about tribals being progressive pro environmental you know you don't have those kind of natural social positioning left has somehow got hooked on to this kind of a very what should i say very lazy thinking that you know dalits are always progressive uh, dalits would naturally be against right or obcs because the shudras on the varna system have, will always be naturally anti hindutva or tribals will always be pro uh, radical left i don't think politics provides you that kind of privilege it's all about creating social narrative for instance the way right is creating you know it is manufacturing facts it is manufacturing imagination it is doing all kinds of things because to, to achieve what to make these groups fit into their social narrative for instance i have uh, wrote couple of years back a piece in hindu on uh, three volumes that you know uh, solanki who is a bjp mp from madhya pradesh who is himself a dalit has written about uh, caste system and they they argue that you know vedic uh, hindu past never had caste system caste system came with the muslim invasions so those who were forced to uh, skin cows and kill cows because muslims ate beef they became dalit and those hindus who resisted forceful conversion but could not physically take on the muslims and ran away into the forest became tribals you know i mean it's 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 a bizarre but the point is this that they are able to see that kind of a narrative has a certain possibility and i can see that this is becoming gradually the common sense the new common sense among people the people think caste system has come into in india because of either british or or the muslims this is what rss has consistently done for last 70 years so politics often operates through social narratives so we will have to imagine other kinds of narratives which are progressive and i think there is i see there is a possibility that you no know, people still uh, uh, in india would want our for discussion there is a certain argumentative tradition and therefore it, it's a complex business for left to see how to fuse this multiple caste multiple classes which have different uh, interests which have conflicting interests that we keep those conflicts towards social transformative process but we can also tie them together Uh, on other contexts i think that's that that i think as you rightly pointed ko some these writings i read them that way that there is a possibility that we are a multi class society we cannot have a clear cut revolutionary strategy that uh, perhaps more or uh, in russia they followed on europe you know one of the points that ko some these says is that the difference from europe is that the mode of production in india moved through adjustment and not displacement that we keep accommodating and adjusting you know barrington moore talks about why india remained democracy uh, unlike other south asian or southeast asian countries is because of this porous nature of hinduism i think we'll have to take that porous nature of hinduism and rearticulate in a progressive transformative direction while re- while what right is doing is to use that liberal space within hinduism to instill a hierarchical authoritarian uh, kind of politics so we'll have to look at that imaginary and that we have to understand that we have to build that narrative it's not readily available you know much of left thinking because of its structural analysis somehow feels that either uh, you have ready made social groups which are antagonistic or you believe that you know neoliberalism will create one fine morning a huge social conflict between two groups like a kurukshetra day and then you'll have the doomsday where people will clash and then there will be a revolution i don't think anything any such thing would happen even if neoliberalism sustain systematically creates inequalities those inequalities will be mediated through imaginations like today inequalities are being created but those are turning into intra subaltern conflicts or a conflict between dalits between obcs and dalits between dalits and muslims between dalits and adivasis so this is because inequality is growing but your imagination of inequality is not Uh, what left imagines they imagine inequality in different ways they imagine mobility in different ways they imagine status in different ways so we'll have to peg into those concrete discourses and uh, create a new transformative discourse no thank you ajay and th- that was even more enlightening and and i think uh, uh, speaking to you more and more uh, uh, makes me very elated uh, uh, you know i think all your observations are right and uh, Uh, definitely i hope a lot of work needs i, I mean there's, there's definitely a lot of work needs to be done and i hope uh, it will be done in the right way uh, and you know even this development discourse uh, you know 
where where people can where people subtly move towards right wing populism but they don't openly say it's right wing because they expect a, a lash back from the people uh, you know the gra- uh, grassroots level people uh, you know all these things uh, the, 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 it's such a complex thing it's it's not easy and it's not nothing is black and white and uh, it's all gray areas that we need to really deal with and there's a lot of challenge ahead of us i agree uh, i think i think i've spoken too much now let uh, let others uh, ask their questions no Thank your you, interventions have been uh, simply great uh, swami and i hope uh, you know this telangana vidyavantala vedika takes a lead in making critical interventions into fossilized left discourse you know often left is very edgy about criticism and especially about public criticism i think we'll have to create an atmosphere Uh, to really understand right wing no point that you are making in terms of this multiple thing look at the whole organizational structure of rss that rss today people, rss understands this point that people in india do not easily consent for uh, violence and therefore uh, rss continuously washes ha- its hands off of all kinds of public attacks which are otherwise organized by them you know that shows that rss understands a certain kind of public sentiment a certain kind of public morality that is there and and it it uh, it configures its politics around that because they understand that politics is about perceptions and time left takes uh, these things not as trivial as cultural as epiphenomenal as backward but uh, these are things that really matter and we'll have to peg into those uh, discourses so i think i'm glad we are on the same page and uh, uh, let's i hope Uh, it, it is a collective project that all of us need to take in the next decade or so in terms of generating this alternative kind of social imaginary for a left politics in india right right yeah i, I think uh, the, we see uh, kiran sahaja and uh, shekhar from canada uh, uh, you guys please uh, uh, and i ask your questions and uh, i think ajay has provided a very valuable uh, uh, very valuable discourse uh, which needs to happen in india uh, because all the social narratives that uh, uh, right is appropriating are very dangerous for uh, uh, for uh, you know for for all of us not just uh, uh, people people who think uh, from the marginalized or from the dalit perspective uh, but from for for everyone who wishes for the progress of the society so please do intervene thank you Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sure. uh, yeah, please. Uh huh. Ask. Yeah. This, this is Sahaja. Uh, so, uh, I, I can't tell how enlightening this session is for me because once we come to US and you know we do our masters and then get into the job and then all these things. But listening to listening to your your lecture right now made me feel like <clears throat> I I haven't even been thinking about all these things and uh, it's I I cannot. I, I second Swami and uh, Swami Garu saying that it was very enlightening for me, and I after after listening to your lecture, I'm going to read. You said that you also authored some books, so I'm going to start reading those books because uh, if your 30 minute lecture is this good, I, I'm pretty sure that your book is going to be um, more educational. So I really appreciate uh, Swami uh, Swami Garu and uh, Saji Gopal Garu for o- organizing this kind of sessions and. Ah, uh, this is my first session to be in this um, for Telangana Vidya Vantula Vedika, and I hope there are like previous recordings that I can listen to. Ah, uh, but I really appreciate this opportunity, and um, it's 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 awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Sajja. Thanks. Glad you liked it, and hopefully you'll follow uh, the general discourse, not just my writings, but general discourse that is going on. And uh, US have seen is a fairly isolationist society. So I hope you overcome by tying yourself up with uh, Vidya Vantala Vedika Telangana is a good forum for you to keep uh, tap on the current discourses in India. Yeah, I I agree. I I did have roots when I was back in India. Like you know, my parents read a lot, and like you like you said an example, like Kamma's are the one of the uh, cast that like took up the uh, the initiative in this, and my family had like. past roots in it and my parents are like that so that's how i caught on to it so i used to like read books after my 10th grade and until i was in india but once i came to us until like very recently i mean i was going through some personal struggles too 
I've just started getting back to uh, this this kind of ideology and reading books and all about that. And this is very timely for me. I've been reading about socialism, communism, capitalism just yesterday and today. I've been watching documentaries, so this completely falls in place for me. Uh, and I'll stay in touch. Uh, and thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we also Kiran and uh, we have somebody from uh, Shaker. Yes. Shaker, would you like to ask? Just introduce yourself, and would you like to sure, ask sure. a question? Thank you, thank you, sir, for uh, you know uh, coming to this North America and hosting this on behalf of Telangana Vidya Vantula Vedika. So I myself Telugu speaker from, uh, but I have been here in the Halifax for almost uh, seven years. And uh, of course, we had met in uh, Bangalore in the last, um, uh, I think last year uh, in the summer, you know, uh, I think uh, that was in May and June. Uh, uh, yeah, sometime in the last last year. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, I mean, I, I know I am familiar with your readings and your, uh, you know, speeches and all like that. I, I think this right is right wing or fascist nature of this uh, Indian government is keep growing, growing and growing in a bigger way. And it's going to affect a lot um, um, uh, in India in, in coming uh, days. Uh, sorry, I, I want to introduce a little bit about myself and uh, uh, myself I am doing, a, uh, I am actually a lecturer at Dalhousie University okay. in Halifax in sociology and social anthropology and psychology department. And also I work part-time uh, lecturer at Mount St. Vincent University in Eastern Maritimes, so, which is not very far away from New York, but uh, uh, you know, uh, this is like we share mo mostly this uh, same ecological, uh, uh, you know, climate uh, in Atlantic from the Atlantic Ocean. So, uh, so just I want to just reflect on uh, Dr. I mean uh, Ajay uh, uh conversation. Um, uh, the uh, you know viewpoints. Uh, I think um, so. Mostly uh, 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 the uh, you know, his viewpoints reflect on the uh, right-wing populism. I think in both the Telugu-speaking uh, states, Telangana and uh, uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, they, they matter a lot because last three decades, it has been part of the political uh, platform uh, in addressing the social problems. At the same time, this uh, right-wing populism, uh, especially in the last 10 years, actually, actually help to inc increase uh, uh, more and more social inequalities and divisions among uh, the uh, 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 so, uh, Telugu speaking states, especially uh, BC, OBC versus SC and SC versus ST like that. And I, uh, I mean, uh, so I, actually I don't want to reflect on all this, but I want to just Give, uh, give my uh, just. I am curious to know a little bit about this. Uh, this major political parties like especially BJP and the this uh, uh, non BJP that's uh, Congress and its allies uh, who have been ruling India for almost uh, uh, yeah almost seven decades or whatever. But uh, uh, how, how could this uh, uh, right wing populism? Uh, uh, I don't know. I I got lost a little bit, but sorry about that. But you know, just I'm I'm thinking about this. That is what right wing populism does. To <laughs> <you lose. laughs> yes. Uh, this uh, you know, uh, I was thinking of this uh, globalization and neoliberalization. I think you have rightly pointed out uh, about that neoliberalism, how it is going to be like you know. Um, um, to certain extent, like addressing these social issues and not 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 like uh, so the entire social transformation, but um, I was wondering, like you know, if uh, this kind of platform, political platform, could lead to any uh, what you call a radical transformation of society in uh, uh, in in like next coming two decades or maybe next twenty years or something, uh, it's only like my just curious, but I, I don't think BJP will 
I don't know if BJP will get into the next elections or I mean, you know, get the majority uh, in the next bipolar elections to uh, rule the, the, the same way as that they are doing in India. But um, um, the, so that is my small uh, uh, yeah question. But at the same time, I mean, I, I uh, so I also want to thank. Uh, Saji Gopal Agaru and uh, uh, all uh, even participants, Saja Kurlagunta and uh, Swami Garu and uh, Kiran Dasari Garu and Professor Vanamala Madam. I think I have uh, met Professor Vanamala Madam in the last year and I'm so, so thankful to be part of this one and also thanks a lot, uh, Ajay sir. Yeah, thanks, Shekhar. It was good to have you on program. You know, only raise a uh, minor question, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's not the question of, you know, whether 2019 BJP is going to come back to power or not. That's, I think, a much uh, less important question. The, the more important question is even being out of power, what they've been able to succeed in this last 10 odd years is to create a new kind of a common sense, a new kind of a social narrative of othering of uh, Muslims, a new kind of an acceptance to a uh, very authoritarian kind of rule new kind of acceptance of public violence against minorities and vulnerable, uh, new kind of discriminate justification of gendered practices. So I think right is able to revive all that was obscurantist uh, in our own uh, traditions, in our own past. Uh, so that's the more worrying part. You know, it's not about BJP whether they'll win in 2019 or not. Even if they're out of power, they can create this through look. They run about 20,000 odd uh, uh, schools, RSS runs uh, shakas. Now they have adopted. Look at the ingenuousness of uh, RSS that they have now found that there's a massive urbanization that is happening. So they have recently started what is called apartment pracharak. Right. That one who goes to apartments to apartments because in apartments they found that people are isolated. So they are now creating common activities. And you talk to people in general, you know, they say that RSS is, doesn't do anything. They only indulge in cultural activities. They only bring people together. Uh, they're very harmless. Look at the kinds of narratives they have created, uh, you know, uh, which shows that they have tuned into what is acceptable in popular uh, morality and then tuning their politics, their ideology through those narratives. Uh, uh, left, I think we have failed both to understand the existing uh, public morality and in creating new social imaginaries. The point is we cannot create new social imaginaries unless we understand uh, the existing social imagination of people. So we'll have to dig into both and connect them. And that's where what Gramsci would call, that's the idea of being organic. Organic does not mean just somebody who's born in Dalit and comes from Dalit caste. That's not organic. Organic idea of organic intellectual is precisely somebody who is representative of existing public morality and can create the new social imaginary linked to that uh, existing social narrative. That's what it was meant uh, by organic intent. That's how we have to now create those kinds of organic discourses and organic intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, sir. And also, just I want to say a couple of things here. This just I want to, uh, I mean, uh, add to your uh, viewpoint because uh, the Western part, like Western neoliberalism, uh, makes, I mean, it it, uh, it influences the near India's uh, social and development policies. Uh, I have been think, I have been teaching this, uh, you know, components in my classes, sociology and anthropology classes. Uh, so basically, uh, World Bank and IMF and also other like uh, European Union organizations, multinational MNCs, like uh, they are the one who basically uh, restructure the Indian policies. And also it is also like, the, you know, blocking the, uh, the transform, social transformation that is, uh, you know, that was uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically was the part of this, uh, 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 Indian constitution, again, I, I think you have uh, rightly pointed out uh, about those uh, neoliberal, uh, uh, you know, features of the, this right-wing populism, and th thanks a lot, sir, uh, for, for Thank this. Thank you, Sir. Thanks. Good to have you on the show. <laughs> Thank you, sir.
Yeah, Saji, Shekhar is through. We can't hear you. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shekhar Garu, for uh, sharing your opinion. It's good to be, you know, we'll continue to engage into this dialogue. So, I mean, if anybody wants to ask a question, right, please ask so. In the meantime, right, you have mentioned about, uh, you know, appropriating nationalism or some sort of a progressive nationalism, right? Uh, I mean, we have seen a pattern of nationalism turned into very jingoistic, uh, you know, nationalism, right? Uh, you know, how the right wing has been uh, <coughs> appropriated nationalism to consolidate its political base. But when you say, can you a little bit define about the progressive, right, uh, you know, nationalism, right? Because uh, the left is always uh, under the view of the more taking a more international outlook rather than uh, nationalistic. Yeah, Sajid, these are not mutually exclusive differences. The problem with left discourse has been they have created too many binaries. You don't have to be not be a nationalist to be an internationalist. You can always create a discourse of nationalism. I think Mao's discourse in China, if you read Chinese history of the Chinese revolution, I think Mao created a sense of nationalism in China. And you can see that even today. Mm -hmm. I've been to China last year. Mm -hmm. And for me, Maoism is essentially nationalism. It worked because it was nationalistic in nature. Mm -hmm. And he forged alliance with Chiang Kai-shek. Look at Lenin. Lenin's uh, new economic program soon after <coughs> taking over power in Russia. So mm -hmm. there have been dialectical movements forward and backward. We'll have to re. Therefore, in, in in India, I think you have had progressive. You have discourses of critique of nationalism by Tagore, but you have progressive sense of nationalism like Gandhi. Gandhi used Hindu identity in, in progressive ways. He interpreted Mahabharata. He says for him, Bhagavad Gita is essentially a document of peace. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. a, a story that talks only about war. Gandhi says for me, it is essential story of peace. So I think we can argue on the other hand that uh, Bhagavad Gita creates a dharma of equality. There's nothing that prevents us. I know this, we don't have to have this kind of binarized thinking that if you're traditional, you can't adjust to progressive thinking. If you're secular, you can't be religious. If you are uh, symbols, it doesn't mean you're non-material. If it is evidence, it doesn't mean that it has no symbolism. I think this kind of a whole range of false binaries that left discourse has created. Uh, which again, as I say, is sheer lazy thinking, we will have to break it. And uh, this is what one can start learning from right, that right is able to fuse and create those debinarized discourses. Mm -hmm. We'll have to now learn from right, quote unquote learn uh, from right, this strategy to say that possible fusion is possible, that politics is all about that kind of possibility. So right knows how to create it because they understand the ground situation, mm -hmm. they know what is the limit, they know public morality as a limit. Having said that, one has to consider that left has a much a difficult task on hand because we are talking about whole kind of structural mm -hmm. transformation. Right, of course, is not interested in that, but it's reinforcing existing hierarchies. <clears throat> we do have a very tough task. We talk about mobilization of a subaltern caste. For instance, if you took, take left equation with Muslims, left I think are the uh, one group uh, which, uh, which has been defending the minority cause in India. But if you talk to an average Muslim, uh, they, while they, they see that left is secular, but they also uh, have a distaste for left because they think it's essential about atheism. <laughs> so, you know, this is very strange. Left you know, loses both ends. Uh, the majority Hindu society hates uh, left because they think we are pro-Muslim. Muslims hate us because we think they think we are rationalists. I, I, right. so I think we are in a, we are we are getting caught. You know, we are uh, spinning webs around ourselves, knotting ourselves, and caught getting cornered. <coughs> I think we have to open up these knots uh, and think in terms of popular appeal and populism and so, popular appeal does not mean dilution of politics. It does not mean mere being superficial. Uh, it does not mean and Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Ajay, I, I, I definitely agree with uh, your statement. But one thing I just want to add is huh. we should not forget the perspective. I, I agree with your organic perspective also. Huh. And, and I also believe that those, if you have to be organic, it doesn't, I mean, if you, you don't have to be born from those communities. But being in that community will definitely help your experience and your knowledge and your, uh, your uh, what do you call, uh, <clears throat> 
your your world uh, perspective right world your world yeah. world view and yeah. uh, uh, but one but thing i agree but from it's not natural my point is that the same experience can be signified for even right wing agenda you know stigma yes yes definitely definitely also, see, stigma see, can that, also uh, lead you to supporting fascism agree agree, yeah. agree. see the, 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 i think the point that you have been making from the beginning in your lecture is how right wing people have appropriated these things right and exactly today uh, a, a dalit a dalit could become more dangerous than an upper caste person uh, from a right wing perspective and look, look at the president you know president himself is an example is a standing example right is an rss dalit who believes in hinduist uh, hierarchy than uh, anybody any brahmin can believe it so i'm i'm not denying your aspect but what i'm trying to say is if you want to create an alternate alternate narrative or alternate uh, you know alternate discourse you have to have that organic perspective right without that we are lost i mean you brought you brought in the example of gandhi right gandhi appropriated bhagavad gita uh, to a to a different uh, perspective i don't think he meant it for the people right because bhagavad gita can never be interpreted for the people in no matter what you say mm-hmm. right it clearly has that hierarchy in it it clearly has that uh, violence in it it clearly has that uh, you know it says perform your karma and mm-hmm. and forget about it mm-hmm. Uh, your your next birth will re- uh, reward you you know things like that right those, those are definitely anti people anti workers anti uh, anti um, the people the people who come from the grassroots level right mm-hmm. so uh, leaving that aside i think today we can definitely approve uh, we can definitely build a narrative uh, and a common sense around symbols within our own mythology which represent the marginalized which represents the subaltern you know Uh, and which which can talk from that perspective and and i think i, I completely agree with your point that rss i mean bjp even if it loses it will not lose next election i'm 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 that is my gut feeling it will definitely win it probably the, after that after another 5 years of uh, destroying indian ethos maybe it will lose but that's a different thing by then it would have created that common sense that you're talking about yeah. and i think it, it's our responsibility as progressive thinkers or progressive with progressive ideologies to build that alternate common sense based on the organic perspective uh, and that's where i have uh, uh, i'm i'm really glad that you brought these points up uh, and uh, thank you again I, i i really can't tell you how much i appreciate your uh, uh, speech for me if possible <laughs> turn on your video but yeah i mean even if you look at the examples of vietnam vietnam's liberation and south african liberation nationalism played a significant role right um uh, you know in mobilizing the masses but i think maybe the left are progressive and revolutionary they have to define a new form of nationalism from a people's perspective obviously we we don't want to get into the trap of uh, you know this uh, jingoistic nationalism we may have to uh, you know come with a new theorizing how nationalism could be from a people's perspective right from the from you know down trod and perspective that uh, that has to be defined and also uh, effort has to be made you know in mobilizing you know putting a persuasive argument uh, in front of the you know masses right uh, but i mean do you think uh, do you uh, let us uh, maybe if you will take a few more questions if you look at the the political parties in india right the principal opposition other political parties do you think are they able to understand the challenges of this right wing uh, you know right wing populism are they able to offer a i mean uh, a counter narrative an alternative model to the you know this right wing politics no that's that's i think the whole crisis is you no know, in popular thing it gets articulated as dynasty rule uh, and uh, no, rahul gandhi not being popular i think that uh, that's not the issue at all i think mm-hmm. rahul gandhi will become easily acceptable overnight if he has an effective social narrative the crisis of the alternate politics today uh, like congress is that they don't have an alternative narrative and that has happened because systematically the kind of politics that have followed have, have sort of dismantled but one quick instance is that you know in india secularism was a, a modality of establishing welfare state what congress did in 90s was dismantle welfare state pursue well secularism and it made absolutely no sense 
you cannot have secular ethos in a country which is not social democratic and welfare oriented the congress this this kind of a self goal it dismantled welfareism it it has uh, uh, sort of abused and uh, you no know, delegitimized subsidies delegitimized protection of the uh, uh, weaker groups and talked about secularism that has created a space for the right to resignify and articulate secularism as a peacement rearticulate secularism as a, a creating groups which are lazy and not work oriented and in focus that secularism in india can go only with welfare state you cannot have secularism without welfare state so for congress has sort of dismantled its so you know politics is like creating this assemblages and uh, right is today able to make that new assemblage it's able to create you know uh, laklaw and move make this point very interesting point of how these groupings come together and can be dismantled so politics is always an open possibility and today opposition parties have to find this kind of a, a social narrative that is based on strong welfare orientation that has to talk the language of development but that is inclusive look at a bjp it it is it follows an exclusionary path but what was what is its prime slogan sabka saath sabka vikas so they understand that this sensibility exists in society that it, it has to be inclusive even on secularism they are not denying secularism they are only calling what is being followed is pseudo secularism they are not calling themselves unsecular or uh, uh, you know so therefore the point is they understand that there are sensibilities and they keep tuning to those sensibilities tuning to those perceptions and i think the left is absolutely uh, behind in terms of perception it never understands that perceptions matter in in society you know the question of violence for instance those uh, radical left groups have to say that we are uh, violent not out of choice but out of certain condition you'll have to tune into that to create the space for a legitimacy of you know transformative processes a uh, left somehow has not taken those perceptions a uh, politics business of a uh, politics being essential about creating discourses very seriously they have uh, they have essentially understood politics all about being given structure given social location and somehow wait they're always in this waiting game you know that new liberalism will one day create a wonderful opportunity where left becomes the only alternative not necessary new liberalism can also create fascism so and neo liberalism can also create a social transform it all depends on how what kind of social narratives we generate uh, where larger number of people see themselves in those narratives so as you said social narrative for the opposition is a big problem in india right now hmm. but even if we take the term of left in a very broad sense right left which is comprises of this uh, you know parliamentary you know uh, parties like cp and cpm obviously they have also more or less adopting you know accepted the neo liberal economics right and also we have a revolutionary you know uh, front there are two different uh, you know political ideologies within but uh, if we uh, shift the gears like do you think the revolutionary forces within the indian context right be it uh, be it uh, you know uh, maoist or you know revolutionary forces are they able to present an alternative you know political vision to counter this you know be it the right wing or you know fascist forces no that's a very interesting question my recent book precisely deals uh, with this question this edited volume on revolutionary violence uh, mm-hmm. precisely i end the concluding part of that book talks about revolutionary politics versus populism and part of the problem is this i think uh, uh, we need a maoist movement because it continues to question i think uh, the big uh, contribution that it's making today in terms of this overall atmosphere of fear is that here is a movement that continuously questions and which is i think it's positive upside but does maoist movement understand the complexities that involved i personally don't think they are able to you know generate that kind of symbolism i feel the tremendous human sacrifice that maoists are making yes partly the state Uh, violence exists but also i think it comes because uh, we are not able to create that kind of a political imagination uh, where your movement does not have to run only on the basis of uh, such massive human sacrifice i mean look at the range of people who come from such modest background who have been politicized uh, i don't think we need to gloat over that as a symbol symbolism of being revolutionary uh, nor is violence symbolism of revolutionary 
I think what is revolutionary is our ability to understand this massive diversity in India. So to that extent, I would say that Maoist movement one admires for the kind of commitment it does globally. I think it's one of the rare movements which has an absolute uh, commitment to social transformation. But it is running sheer on the grit of uh, a certain kind of a moral uh, resource. Uh, and a certain kind of a, a sacrifice ideas of sacrifice i don't think they are able to match up to the complexity of political imagination uh, that we need uh, the literature that i get to read and i'm following uh, does not really understand i think uh, this kind of complexity they need to really expand their uh, even intellectual resources to understand how to uh, you know sort of address this kind of a massive complexity that is at hand uh, in india mm. Yeah. So, Sahaja, do you have any question or comment? Okay. So, I can't hear your voice. Are you on mute or? I'm on mute, actually. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. I, I was. Yeah, sure. I even forgot that I was on mute. So. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, no, I just wanted to, like, I, you know, just, I just spoke, so I wanted to absolutely tell you guys how um, i really enjoyed this i mean i shouldn't say enjoyed because you know because of okay, all the, the, uh, it's, it's about the kind of conversation that we had that about the kind of problems we had and maybe i shouldn't use the word enjoyed but then yes it is very enlightening um, n not that i have any solution for this i'm pretty sure <laughs> not most of us have solutions for all the problems but then I think the most important thing about not about the topics that we talked about is about the stages that we have, like the discussion like this is the seeds that have, will be planted in the people who actually listen to this. It's, it's the seed that matters. So now that I'm listening to this, now that I start to think in this way, when I come across something, I will be able to understand it better and also to see it for what it is rather than to see it how it is to see it, how it is being perceived by other people. So I really appreciate this kind of discussion and I hope that we, we will keep having these kind of discussions and, and then get more uh, information and enlightenment of, enlightening of ideologies. Um, and I think I, it, it's great actually. So to say this, uh, I wanted to like turn on my video and then say thank you. That's that I know I have been saying the same thing since the beginning, but then it's been a while that I really was into this kind of conversations, and uh, it's been just a few months that I really started digging deep into this, so it's very, very timely for me. And thank you so much. Yep, yep, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. I think uh, maybe we'll just take one or two questions. Will uh, how much time you have, Ajay? Uh, I think we have already had questions. I mean, it's up to you. I'm, I'm around. I mean. What I'll just, uh, um, I'll make one quick observation, so unless there is another person want to, uh, you know, interrupt, uh, I mean, get into the discussion. Yeah, 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 just, uh, yeah, take a few, yeah, 60 seconds and please, yeah, please do. Uh, is there other person like, you know, <laughs> want to jump in? That's fine, you, you, you take a 60 seconds and make your observation. Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, we, can wind up. we can wind up, I think. In yeah. All right. Uh, just I want to say, like you know, uh, especially on the neoliberalism, and the, it's good to have this uh, uh, video instead of this uh, this one, because um, the war, uh, the historically speaking, like in India, like uh, the loss. Uh, I mean, even uh, during the co co colonial times and the post-colonial times after British had left, historically speaking, like. Regardless of the left and the uh, right wing, it has always been uh, like this uh, bourgeois who uh, basically uh, was behind this uh, social and political movements, um, political framework of uh, of that country. Because um, uh, you know, I I was reading uh, other Jain profs who have written uh, uh, about the health policy and social development and also other other uh, pieces of uh, sociology and anthropology and political sciences, uh, political science. So basically uh, uh, the way they have, uh, you know, uh, structured this, uh, uh, this Indian social and the political system is that, you know, uh, so basically helping the bourgeois 
And even British did the same thing at this post-colonial bourgeois who, who were able to capture the power after uh, this uh, uh, independence. They were doing the same thing like, so will it be an alternative? Will it be a, uh, will there be a, some, you know, a new, uh, I don't know, kind of new um, solution for this, like to, in order to uh, radically transform the Indian uh, social system, uh, because uh, yeah, that, that's like just I'm curious, and I just don't want to repeat the, the same point. But uh, okay. yeah, uh, if there is any some reflection on that, like thanks. You have any quick response, Ajay? Uh, yeah, I think we have discussed this thing uh, that we don't have easy alternatives, but the entry points what we are discussing, we can't. You know, so let's collectively carry on this process. I don't think. I can be like Krishna, give a Hitabodha. I can only show you these are the issues. We'll have to collectively think, plug in, and let's see where it goes. So politics is always an open-ended game. So we'll have to, with that in mind, uh, start generating social discourses. Yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and thank I mean, I was thinking about this land reform movements and the, the left yeah. and pseudo-left. So we'll we'll, right we'll wind up, uh, Saji. Thank you. Huh? Right, thank yeah, you, yeah. Uh, Shekhar. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, okay. And is yeah. uh, Vanmala Madam is also going to be reflecting on this? Uh, like, mm -hmm. I was, <laughs> because <laughs> Madam is, is was listed on these topics, so I, I was uh, curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Topic. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we have, uh, yeah, we already crossed like 60 minutes. Yeah, I, I understand we want to continue our dialogue, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> so right. we will do it, you know, some other time. Right. Yeah. Please do. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gop Gopal and uh, Gopal and uh, Ashur, uh, uh, Ajay and others. Uh, I just want to mention one thing. Uh, Sadaf just sent me a text saying that she was unable to join okay. because her other event uh, ran uh, uh, ran over and uh, you know she she was delayed and uh, she's driving now so she wouldn't be able to join. Uh, but she she conveyed her. Uh, her uh, apologies uh, for not being able to join. But yeah. one thing is true, uh, living in the United States uh, for the past uh, 20 years and having seen Trump's rhetoric and Trump's populism, <laughs> uh, there is no, there's not much difference between uh, uh, what, what the RSS is doing there and out here. Of course, here the presence of left is different. The presence of Marx, uh, Marxian left or Marxism is different. But uh, one thing is true, if you can imagine whole belt containing of workers, workers whom left treats them to be the highest citadel of their, uh, of their social agenda and discourse. Uh, you know, those, 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 those people, those left, right, whether the rust belt of uh, uh, starting from Detroit to uh, Pennsylvania uh, or uh, the coal belt in Ohio and West Virginia and uh, uh, the other states, uh, they have voted uh, unanimously for Trump and also some black voters from North Carolina also voted for Trump. Women voters voted for Trump indicates that he was very, very, uh, very, very uh, efficient in appropriating uh, uh, the rhetoric or, or the narrative of the, of the left so far and what globalization has done to this country and its economy. And he's saying make America great again and bring jobs back again and things like that. So all those are, uh, they, they resound uh, very well with uh, with what is going on back in India as part of right-wing populism. So uh, there's not much difference. I wish Sadaf was here to uh, speak more about it because she's actively participating in democratic politics here. But we can... Okay. Swami? Okay. Yes. Okay. Swami? Okay. Oh, anyway, I think uh, I want to thank you on behalf of Telangana Vijayantala Vedika, North America you know, for attending today's meeting about right-wing populism. Thanks a lot for Professor Ajay Pravarti and also uh, Professor Vanamala and also everybody who has watched Sahaja and, you know, uh, Shekhar and everybody, the people who watched through this, uh, <clears throat> this video conference through Heart of Telangana. I think uh, we, be it from Indian experience or American experience, right, it is very important to understand the characteristics of right-wing ideology, be it anti-immigrant, anti-minority, anti-progressive, right? I think uh, it becomes a responsibility for us, right? To present an alternative, you know, uh, 
political model or development model and to shape you know public opinion for a more a, a society a just society you know where people can really enjoy the civil rights and you know fair share of you know development fruits i think we'll continue our dialogue and thanks a lot and you know we will conclude this uh, you thank know. you so much for organizing this yeah thanks, thanks sir ajay sir thank you thanks yeah. sir thanks sir and thanks sir swami and uh, sajay for this wonderful opportunity yeah keep, keep in touch no it, it was our pleasure to have you ajay and it was our pleasure to see you resound uh, what is in our minds to uh, regarding uh, the situation back there you know we don't want mm -hmm. to hear uh, the same old clichés uh, you know and and definitely your uh, your speech was very mm -hmm. refreshing thank you so much thanks, yeah i mean after publishing your book maybe uh, i don't know how long it's going to take will maybe we'll put like a one more uh, <clears throat> you know lecture on your you know after releasing of your yeah, i think my i am putting all these in uh, forthcoming book yeah yeah we sure. can sort of uh, yeah. from, from discussion around the book organize <laughs> uh shekhar and sajay you can also share your contact information with uh, you know ajay so that we can be in touch you know for the future program sure definitely yeah sure. Yeah. Hmm? yeah yeah thank you thank you everybody thank you thank you so thank you bye bye thank you ajay okay bye sajay thank you we'll talk sajay tomorrow yeah yeah thank you yeah okay thanks bye thank you thank you thank you everybody yeah